grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You all know my two boys pretty well by now. You have seen them raised here in the church for the last three years, and you all know that I love my boys very, very much. That said, there's something my boys do which absolutely drives me nuts. And that is they constantly compare themselves to one another. Now I know this is probably nothing new with just my two boys. I'm sure many of you who have had kids or grandkids, you've seen it in your children as well. And I'm sure that I did it when I was younger, although I honestly don't remember. But for example, if Trish or I tell Dietrich to go into the living room and clean things up, the very first thing he asks is, where's Dustin? What's Dustin doing? Dietrich's not interested in doing any chore if Dustin isn't right there beside him doing the exact same thing. And the same is through, true for Dustin. If Trish or I tell Dustin, hey Dustin, it's time to go to bed, the first thing he'll retort is, well, why does Dietrich get to stay up so late? Regardless of the fact that Dietrich is probably already in bed and asleep. <laughs> My two boys constantly compare themselves to one another, and it has gotten so bad that at times, in a very stern, fatherly voice, I have to tell them not to worry about their brother, just concentrate on what we've told you to do. Well, as this behavior has gotten worse over the years, my patience has been pushed to the limit, and I have held very, very fast to the hope that someday, someday soon, they would grow out of this behavior. I have held on to that hope, that is, up until I studied our gospel reading for today. You see, as I read the text for this morning, I soon realized that this temptation to compare ourselves to one another really is a lifelong struggle. Well, as we turn to our gospel reading for today, we hear the familiar parable of the laborers in the vineyard. As Jesus tells it, there is a man who owns a great vineyard, and he goes out first thing in the morning, and he finds men to work in the field. Now, by the Roman clock, the day began at 6 a.m., and it ended at 6 p.m. So the owner of the vineyard, he agrees with these men to work for one denarius, for 12 hours. But that's not the end of the story. The owner of the vineyard goes back out three hours later at 9 a.m. and he still finds other men standing idly in the marketplace. And he says, you too, go out and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they go and they work in the vineyard. But the owner doesn't stop. He goes back out at the sixth hour, at the ninth hour. He finds more and more men and encourages them to go out and work in the vineyard as well. And then he finally goes out one last time at five o'clock. It's the eleventh hour of the day. And he still finds more men standing idly in the marketplace. And he says, you too, come and work. And they go and they work. Well, the end of the day comes, the six o'clock bell rings, and it's time to pay the men what they're owed. And so the owner of the vineyard, he tells the foreman to line them up last to first. So those who worked only one hour from five o'clock to six o'clock, they receive their wages first. And you know the story, as they go up to the foreman, he pays each of them one denarius. It was an exceedingly generous wage for only one hour of the day. But it was also what the men needed 
in order to live. Well, the guys who had been there since 6 a.m., they see what's happening, and no doubt they start to get excited. Apparently, the owner of the vineyard, he's changed the pay scale. Instead of a denarius a day, it's a denarius an hour. And these men get excited, expecting that when they get paid, they will get not one day's wage, but almost two and a half weeks worth of wages. But of course, that doesn't happen, does it? They get up to the front of the line, and they too get one denarius. Everyone who worked in the field that day got exactly the same wage. It didn't matter if they worked one hour, two hours, three hours, six hours, or 12 hours. They all got the same wage, one denarius. Well, you've got to admit that just isn't right. I mean, the very idea that all the workers would get exactly the same pay for doing vastly different amounts of work, it offends our sensibilities and our cultural norms. Our very society is based upon the fact that everyone gets paid according to what they've done. And any disparity rubs us the wrong way. All men are created equal. And so if you work harder, longer, harder, you deserve more. You know, I remember in my undergraduate days when I was up at Metro State working on my broadcasting degree, there was a student club that held a, a bake sale every spring. But it wasn't just any bake, skip, bake sale. And said it was based upon who was buying the cookies. So for a white male like myself who wanted a bag of cookies, I had to pay one dollar. But if you were a black male, you only had to pay 85 cents. If you were a white woman, you only had to pay 75 cents. And if you happened to be a black woman who wanted a bag of cookies, you only had to pay 65 cents. The point of the bake sale was to bring attention to the disparity of wages in the United States. To bring attention to the fact that we expect that regardless of who you are, when you do the same amount of work, you expect the same amount of pay. You see, from a very early age, we are taught that we are all equal. Not because anyone is better or worse. And so if you work harder, if you work longer, if you put in more hours, if you are more faithful at your job, you deserve a higher wage. In fact, this is one of the very ideas that created the workers' unions in the first place. Equity and protection for those working in the factories. But let's go back to the parable for a moment. You see, when it came time for everyone to get paid, the problem is not that the people weren't paid properly. They all were. Everyone was paid exactly what they had agreed to. They were paid according to the contract. The problem was when they started comparing themselves to one another. Listen again to the words of our Lord. This comes from verses 10 through 12. Jesus said, Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us. Well, there it is. The root of the problem in the text, it's not that the workers weren't paid properly. Everyone got exactly what they had agreed to, and even more, they got what they needed to live on. 
But instead, the problem came when they started comparing their wages to one another. And it was right then that the workers' discontent began. It reminds me of what one of my seminary professors, Professor Gibbs, used to say. He would say, all comparisons are odious. All comparisons stink because in the end, they all lead to discontentment. Well, unfortunately, the temptation to compare ourselves to one another, it is even here in the church as well. The first recorded instance of this comes right before our text for today. If you back up in Matthew just a little bit, Jesus is teaching the disciples about how difficult it is to get into heaven. He says the familiar phrase that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus says this, the disciples are completely dumbfounded, wondering if that's true, then who can possibly get into heaven? And then Peter speaks up. Peter pipes up and he says, Lord, we have left everything to follow you. What then will we receive? And there it is again. St. Peter comparing himself and what he has sacrificed, wondering what he's going to get out of it. Will I get more? I've given up everything. Shouldn't I have a place of honor? And the same thing happens today. It is so easy for any one of us, me included, for any one of us to look at our service, to look at our sacrifice to the church and wonder, what will we get in return? All those years we've spent baking in the church kitchen or singing in the choir or serving on a committee. All the time that we have dedicated to Bible study and Sunday school and evening devotions and confirmation class. All those special events that we have attended the baptisms and confirmations and weddings and funerals and picnics and car shows. It is so easy for any one of us to look at our service, what we've given to the church, all those tithes and donations to keep the church growing and thriving. And we look at that and we start believing that we deserve more, more power, more recognition, more influence. After all, all men are created equal, right? If we work harder, if we work longer, if we are more faithful, we deserve more. But once again, whether it's implicit or explicit, all comparisons are odious. All comparisons stink. They reek. Because eventually it will lead to discontentment. If you go back to our gospel reading one more time, the real key to the whole problem is found in the very first verse. In fact, it's the first few words, and it probably was read so quickly that you passed over it without even thinking about it. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God. You see, our Heavenly Father, He isn't building a company. He isn't building a corporation or a workers' union. He isn't building some institution that you can buy shares in and gain influence in. Instead, he's building a community. In fact, 
He's building a family. His family. Based solely upon the death of his only son, Jesus Christ. And the sad fact of the matter is, is that all the work that you and I have done, all the good works, all the prayers, all the dedication, if you wrapped it all up together, you couldn't buy a single square inch of God's kingdom. You and I can never, ever do enough to buy even the smallest share of God's kingdom. And it doesn't matter whether it's here on earth or the glories of the hereafter. And so because we can't do enough, God simply gave it to us. Not just a square inch, but the whole thing. Grace upon grace has been bestowed upon you, upon every baptized child here today. It doesn't matter if you are young or old, if you've served for a year or 80. We have all received exactly what we needed. The forgiveness of our sins and the sure and certain hope of everlasting life. We have been adopted into a community, adopted into God's family, a family that loves us, supports us, and encourages us each and every day. It is a treasure far more valuable than all the world's riches in a gift worth a whole lifetime worth of labor. And it is then, right then, in response to that overwhelming gift, that we in turn give our whole lives back to God as a living sacrifice. We don't look for anything in return. No prize, no greater influence, because we have already received far more than we deserve. Instead, we offer our whole lives, our service, our praise, our tithes, our offerings. We offer it all as it flows out of a heart overflowing with thanksgiving and joy. Professor Gibbs said, all comparisons are odious. All comparisons reek because ultimately it leads to discontentment. It doesn't matter whether it's between two brothers or between two workers in a vineyard or between two servants here in the church. It doesn't matter how long we've served or how much we've donated. Because God has already graciously given us far more than we deserved. Instead, he has given us exactly what we needed. The forgiveness of our sins in life eternal in Jesus Christ. For all of this, it is our duty to thank, praise, to serve, and obey him. This is most certainly true. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.